guess what? I'm late for another yearly top 10. I know that's nothing new. But to compensate, I decided to do a quick rundown on some of the games that left an impression on me, or some of the honorable mentions that didn't make it into this list. Contrary to most, I didn't enjoy Sonic Frontiers that much. The cyber stages in particular felt anemic and bland since they're pretty much rehashes of previous level layouts. At least the open world was interesting to explore, but the novelty ran dry after the second or third zone. Tinykin is a charming 3D platformer where you explore a giant house. It has tight controls, and using the titular Tiny King to solve puzzles is very intuitive. Bayonetta 3 was easily my most anticipated game, and it's also my biggest disappointment in years. With poor combat implementation of the summons, a mediocre secondary character, and perhaps one of the worst endings I've ever witnessed in a game. Vampire Survivors may look like another bland mobile game, but then you find yourself spending 20 to about 200 hours trying to unlock everything. It's incredibly addicting. And Stray, uh, it has a cat, which I guess by internet laws I must love it. Okay, look, I think it's a decent game, and I love cats, they're adorable, but I just felt this sci-fi twist they added to it felt a bit unnecessary. Now, let's talk about my actual top 10 games of 2022. Kirby had a rough transition into 3D. Said no one. Even myself, the curmudgeon who doesn't like Kirby, had his heart finally melt so I could finally realize what everyone sees in the pink puffball. Kirby in the Forgotten Land is a textbook example of adapting a series into the third dimension. My favorite thing about this game is how digestible it is. When other games go for the big open world approach, Sometimes I just love playing a tightly designed linear platformer that's drenched with uniqueness. And Forgotten Land is definitely unique, especially with its cheery atmosphere that is filled with colorful visuals throughout. All of Kirby's repertoire of moves are present, from puffing up and flying to swallowing unsuspecting foes. While the number of copy abilities has been reduced, their utility feels even more significant, and they can be upgraded as well. The mouthful mode has been regarded as a meme, but in reality, those moments are nice little breaks in the action. Each level has a bunch of puzzles you have to solve, and rescuing a Waddle Dee at the end of them is probably some of the most fun I've had 100%ing a game. Even the boss fights, which in the past games they were kind of a cakewalk, are so action-packed and dynamic, I actually wanted to fight them again, and you have plenty of chances to. Oh, and don't get me started about the final act and the bosses you have to face, oh my god, it's just whoa! While I may not be his biggest fan, Kirby in the Forgotten Land was a pleasant surprise. Not only that it's gonna entertain both new and old fans alike, at least I have the luxury of telling you all that this game doesn't suck. Oh, come on, you knew this was coming. I have a confession to make. I don't like Generation 4 of Pokemon. I personally thought it had the weakest lineup of new creatures, my least favorite evil team, and Sinnoh as a whole never intrigued me from both a lore and design aspect. Thankfully, Pokemon Legends Arceus not only made me appreciate the history behind the Sinnoh region, but the gameplay loop was the shot in the arm the series desperately needed. The game takes place in the past where the Sinnoh region was actually known as the Hisui region, in which Pokemon and humans didn't exactly get along. Your goal is to help the research of the Galaxy Expedition team to study Pokemon, so one day both sides are going to live in harmony. For the first time in the franchise history, catching them all is the primary objective. Each Pokemon has their own unique behavior that you have to study in order to be efficient at your goal. 
it's even fun just going around all the different areas and find so many unique items that you can combine together in the school crafting mechanic allows you to make new pokeballs and different tools that will help you catch pokemon i would even argue catching is much more fun than battling in this game in fact, battling is easy in my least favorite part of the game because a lot of the core mechanics from the main series are not there, like abilities. Thankfully, battles are not obligatory, except for some story missions. And even then, there's some really good ones, like the one against the giant noble Pokemon. In fact, this rather reinforces the notion this game feels more like a Monster Hunter game than a traditional turn-based RPG. Pokemon Legends Arceus was a risk, and while not everything worked in it, for a spin-off title that was able to turn a lot of the non-fans back into the franchise, it's a resounding success. Unlike another Pokemon game that came out the same year. I'm just kidding, I like Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. What? Did you actually think I was going to abide to the one game per franchise rule? I just have no idea how the same company is able to release two games in the same franchise, but gosh darn those mad lads at Game Freak did it! And at this point, everyone knows about the many technical issues that this game has, especially the frame rate drops. But I would rather not beat a dead horse and focus on the positives. Generation 9 is ambitious in scope, and it finally gave us the open-world Pokemon game that we always wanted. But why do I prefer it over Legends Arceus? Well, for one, I prefer the traditional battles here much more. I love the Generation 9 Pokemon, which I think are some of the best additions to the roster yet. And also how much I love exploring this world, which considering the fact it's just one big area with no loading screens, it's pretty impressive. One of the things I hate the most about the modern Pokemon games is how much it holds your hand, especially towards the beginning of your adventure. So I was really glad that just after a couple of hours, Skeleton Vile just lets you explore its world without any restraint, which is really refreshing. With more polish, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet could have been the best main games in the series since, and I know this is a big statement, Generation 5. Not only for introducing the very first open wall in the franchise, but also has a genuinely likable cast of characters. Not to mention a pretty insane final act that just threw me through a loop and a half. Had the technical issues been ironed out, I could see this game easily reaching the top 5, but even with its flaws, I can't wait to see how Game Freak builds on the foundations of Gen 9 and hope that the next game would be a much smoother sailing. Sifu is easily one of the most badass games I have ever played, and how can you say no to a game in which you seek vengeance against the murderers of your kung fu master? Training for years and embarking on a fist-throwing journey in goon-infested locales such as a bustling nightclub or a fancy museum. That being said, the game requires nothing short of its players due to its mercilessness. In practice, each level doesn't last longer than maybe 15 to 20 minutes, but there is no realistic way to beat the game on your very first try, and that is because you're going to experience death quite a lot. Speaking of which, for every time you die in Sifu, you get older. Die too many times and well, it's game over. And since the death counter increases every time you die, it's best to learn the layout of a level so the number doesn't rack up exponentially. Since the game keeps track of your age at the end of a level, it encourages players to repeat in order to die as little as possible. While repetition is usually frowned upon in gaming, being able to do a perfect run without a single death is extremely rewarding. Sifu is incredibly challenging. But once you get into the rhythm of attacking, parrying, and even using the environment as your own weapon, the game becomes this wonderful symphony of mayhem. And even if you die a lot, each playthrough hones your skills and each victory feels earned. Sifu may be merciless like the tyrant at the end of his revenge quest, 
but those up for the challenge will be rewarded with an excellent action game. As a child of the 90s, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles has been an after-school tradition. Despite my love for the Heroes in a Half Shell, though, I haven't played many of their classic games. But no matter what, as soon as I saw an announcement for Shredder's Revenge, I did not want to miss out. I vividly remember using my Game Pass trial just so I could get my hands on the game on day one for some multiplayer turtle action. However, I eventually got the game on PS5, and I found out that most of my friends didn't have that version. But even without the insanity of six-player co-op, which admittedly is pretty cool, this doesn't change the fact that Shredder's Revenge is one of the best beat-em-up games ever made. And this is coming from someone who just completed every single classic turtle game on the Kaobaga collection. I can compliment the tight controls with a variety of enemies, but what really makes Shredder's Revenge tick for me is its perfect pacing. Even though there are 16 chapters, which is pretty long for a beat-em-up, none of them really feel too long or short. The amount of moves at your disposal combined with the environmental attacks make every combat encounter feel incredibly fresh. In addition, right when you think the action is starting to get stale, there's a cool boss showing up that really mixes things up. I love the 2D pixel aesthetic from the characters, the levels, the UI, but what really drew me in is the sound. First, the soundtrack is downright fantastic thanks to the Sonic Mania maestro himself, T Loops. But second, I love how the original four turtles lend their voices. It further adds credence to the idea that this game is sort of a finale to the 1987 cartoon. Shredder's Revenge isn't just empty fan service for a sake of a quick cash grab, but it's a wonderfully crafted experience. An experience worthy of saying, Kawabunga! Tunic is the kind of game that I don't think I can ever do justice in words, but I will sure as heck gonna try. The easiest way to define Tunic is a top-down adventure game with some dashes of Dark Souls. It has a vibrant array of locations to explore, and the combat is incredibly engaging. The biggest joy in an adventure game like Tunic is discovery, and I mean that in a variety of ways. The game uses the isometric camera angle not just for a cool aesthetic choice, but it's also a clever way of hiding detours that you wouldn't otherwise see pretty easily. Even something as simple as finding a shortcut to a previously visited area is exciting. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are also many items in the game to collect, but all of their description is written in some kind of an undecipherable language. It's moments like these you would defer to a guide, but what Tunic allows you to do is to collect the actual pages of the manual in-game. Sure, most of the manual isn't in English, but if you look in between the lines and see some of the hints, like notes that were probably written by someone, it leads to one of the most creative and also meta ways of solving puzzles in video games. Even if it does lose a little bit of steam towards the end, there is no denying that Tunic is one of the best adventure games in years. I'm doing my utmost best to show as little as possible because I want you to try it out. Because Tunic is an absolute must-play. Back when I made my top 20 games of 2017, I remember how much I adored Horizon Zero Dawn. The biggest hook for me at the time was the amazing world the Guerrilla Games created. Learning more about Aloy's origins and the history behind this primordial future was incredibly fascinating. However, none of those questions have been answered. The mystique sort of vanished in the sequel. But even if the mystery isn't there anymore, that doesn't take away from how much of a step up Horizon Forbidden West actually is. A lot of the original games' issues have been addressed. 
a better melee system, improved stealth, and the introduction of the shield wing which allows Aloy to glide. The core gameplay of taking down various mechanical machines is still incredibly fun, and Aloy got a bunch of new weapons to play around with. The amount of different activities, side missions, hunting jobs that you get to do is downright staggering. Heck, Guerrilla Games actually put a fully functional board game in this! How do they have the time?! It is also one of the most beautiful games this generation, and I'm shocked it's able to hold a steady 60 FPS in performance mode. I also got to care more about Alo's companions compared to the last game, but the character that stole the show for me was Silence, played by the late and great Lance Reddick. I finished the game a week before his passing, and he will be sorely missed. Horizon Forbidden West is a game that manages to tick all the boxes. It looks great, it sounds terrific, and it plays extremely well. The main reason it isn't higher is because, quite frankly, the top three games are on their own tier. But it doesn't take away anything from this accomplishment, and I cannot wait to see what Aloy and her companions have on the horizon. For as she strives to put right what Hades sundered, I have made a new discovery. One that heralds both destruction and opportunity. We're called Neons. Sinners plucked from hell to do God's dirty work. But I'm finding it hard to believe we're in heaven. Everyone play Neon White. I'm not even going to start this entry with a quasi-profound anecdote. Just play this game. Words can't even begin to describe how everything clicks together perfectly to assemble one of the best playing experiences I've had in my entire life. The game tells the story of the titular hero ending up as a gun for hire for the forces of heaven, where he must eradicate demons in order to get his freedom back. In addition, White has to deal with his ragtag group of friends, his himbo BFF yellow, his will they one day lover red, and the keep sharp objects away violet. The story is clearly inspired by anime as the tropes go off the charts, but I like most people, I found all of the story endearing. Some might find the dialogue a little bit cringe, but because the actors delivered the line with such conviction, it's actually really charming. Damn, I'm really working up a sweat. <laughs> oh, me too. You're so lucky you don't have big boobs, White. They get it the worst. Uh, would this be a bad time to mention there is a beach side story? But where the game truly shines is the gameplay. Every level in Neon White is a pure test of skill. The goal is to reach the end of a level while using cards that not only grant unique weapons, but also movement options like a double jump or a horizontal dash. Stringing all those movement abilities together in a perfect succession is how Neon White truly shines. It may feel intimidating at first that the game requires players to get at least a gold medal in order to progress in the story, which is pretty challenging, but here's the thing. The levels themselves are pretty short, so attempting them over and over again never becomes a chore. In fact, the better I got at the level after finishing the first time, I immediately went back and thought to myself, how can I improve my run? How can I use the least amount of cards to reach the goal? Or maybe I can find some kind of a cool shortcut. Neon White is an adrenaline rush infused experience from beginning to end that made me appreciate the art of speedrunning. That dopamine I got from perfecting a run and earning an ace medal was one of the best moments I've had in gaming, well honestly, ever. Not only that Neon White is my favorite indie game of the year, it might be my favorite indie game of all time. And if that isn't a compliment, I don't know what is. Looking at the very first cutscene, you can already tell that God of War Ragnarok is on a class of its own. It took everything that worked in the original game, improved upon it, 
and delivered a powerful and resonating experience. The father-son dynamic is tested like never before in this game. Atreus is looking for answers, often exploring on his own and trying to figure out who the heck he is, and his father, Kratos, is stifling him, still holding on to his old conventions. None of their arguments feel contrived, and this is the heart of the story, which makes it engaging from beginning to end. The side characters are definitely no slouches either, with returning ones like Mimir, Brock, and Sindri getting much more depth this time around, and newcomers like Odin and Thor stealing every single scene they're in. While I admit I was never a big fan of the over-the-shoulder camera angle in the original game, but Sony Santa Monica Studios did a lot of small improvements to make the combat in the successor a lot better. All the weapons are still great, but surprisingly, blocking or parrying at the right moment is as engaging because it leaves the enemy complete open for a barrage of attacks. And the much larger variety of enemies makes every combat encounter memorable and challenging. Exploration is also further expanded upon, so there's a lot more to see in the Nine Realms. And solving all the puzzles, no matter how often they repeat, is still fun because they mix them up in different locations. On top of that, as much as I loved the main adventure, and trust me, I did, the side quests were absolutely fantastic with some amazing set pieces with surprisingly emotional moments. I would also be remiss if I didn't mention that this game looks absolutely gorgeous! And all of the sound design from the music, the voice acting, the sound effects... Oh my god, it's so sublime! God of War Ragnarok doesn't just check all of the boxes, it is a masterclass in every single category. It's the kind of game that even after you finish it, you want to go back in and finish all of the side quests and reach that 100% completion. And if this game truly marks the ending of Kratos' Norse mythology adventures, at least he went out with a bang. go. I know this is probably the most telegraphed number one entry I've ever had on my yearly list, but geez, at the end of the day, what From Suffer did with Elden Ring is a mind-blowing accomplishment. This is the culmination of all the trials and tribulation that this small company went through for decades now, and after honing this craft for so long, they made one of the best games ever. And I know some of you might dismiss the game due to the notoriety of the Souls series, but Elden Ring is the most approachable and fair game that From Software has ever made. Of course, Elden Ring is still incredibly difficult, but the game gives you so many tools to beat seemingly impossible foes that achieving those victories can be attained even by those who never played one of those games before. Even by the small chance you don't happen to have the right tool at the right time, you can always go back and explore a whole different area and find a new powerful weapon or spell that can totally tip the scale when you eventually decide to have that rematch. And it bears repeating that this game is huge, but its vastness serves the gameplay because there's always something new to see and discover. It's incredibly dense with new treasures to find, new enemies to fight, even going back to an area I was at the very beginning held something new. You can even jump on command in a Souls game, and you have your own horse, which is pretty amazing. One of my favorite moments is that I had one of my friends come over to show me the ropes, and it made me realize that I actually skipped the item crafting tutorial near the beginning of the game. And while it was kinda goofy I learned how to craft when I was level 50, it's a testament to how every player can carve their own adventure in Elden Ring without being shuckled by forced linear progression. It's shocking to me, despite how huge Elden Ring is, that it's a miracle that every little detail from the smallest dungeon to the biggest enemy is polished to such extent. 
Those mad lads somehow were able to put five different Souls games in one tightly designed package. Heck, I'm only 50% of the way through with 75 hours in. That's how much there is to see. I have no idea how From Software accomplished all of this, but every single one of them deserves a standing ovation. This has easily been the hardest year to choose my number one. My top three picks kept shuffling all the time. But after long and hard thinking, I cannot deny what a masterpiece Elden Ring is, and that's why it's my number one game of 2022. Thank you for watching.